Hello and welcome back to yet another V8 episode. After the last one we got this thing in the engine bay, which is frankly a ridiculous thing to try and do on my own. But it's in there, just missing a few parts, which are largely scattered around the garage and possibly still at my brother's uh, warehouse in Birmingham. Uh, but we'll see how we go, get as much stabbed in together as we can today and see if we can get it any closer to actually running. Maybe. Oh, that's so much easier. This little dolly trolley thing is actually what my gearbox, the Borgwana Auto Box, has been sat on the whole time the car engine has been out. Now it's underneath this old three and a half litre. My life is improved. I need to get this and its little partner on the other side off of this engine and then I can carry on. I don't know what happened to the Range Rover ones. I think they were different, so I recycled them. Oh, that's not as tight as I expected. I thought I was going to have to wrestle that one. One, ha, ha, ha. Oh, that's helpfully located underneath the exhaust manifold. Oh, at least usefully, not even slightly tight though. So that's, I suppose, the entire weight of the engine is going down, not up. It's more got to stop it sliding around the place rather than having it leap out the bonnet. I suppose really, I should give this a little lick of paint, shouldn't I? Before I go and stick it back in the car. Oh look, that's the back of the old rubber engine mount, which is no longer part of this particular unit. Ah, oh, something of course is tight here. Okay. So in a moment of what I'm gonna call genius and everyone else is gonna call, uh-huh, I bolted this thing back on here so I could get a half by well, 9 16th spanner on it and free this bolt. Otherwise it was never gonna go anywhere hand holding it. See, what a great idea. Not just a hat rack, my friends. Not just a hat rack. I couldn't have these looking quite so scuzzy as this, so give them a good clean up in gunk and some engine enamel to try and make them a bit more presentable. So first, just need to assemble these engine mounts, which sit underneath the engine like this. And this goes in here. A couple of washers. And that's ready to go on. Well, that's ideal. The lift straps in exactly the wrong place. But I can fit it this side. I'm going to have to lower this thing down again and reposition the straps to try and get the other one on. This would probably have been a lot easier when it's still on the garage floor. Right, so I load the engine down, move the rope, raise it up again. Hopefully now I can actually get this thing, there we go, to fit. I'm glad I put the um, bit of fresh paint on this because it looks much better. Now next on my list of super fun activities is getting the gearbox up high enough to bolt on some brackets and support so it's not dragging on the floor. And secondly, figure out what this pipe here that I've somehow damaged is. There's no dripping on the floor. Petrol, I've damaged the petrol line. Great. So, car is resting on the front cross member which is a big solid bit of steel on the big jack and we've got two axle stands underneath the suspension mounting points so the car is well supported and the back of the gearbox is on the old trolley jack so I'm trying to get the speedo drive and the gear linkage in and maybe even bolt the thing up into the floor. These I've numbered one to four on the wires but I didn't number the connectors so I'm going to go with that's number one because it's at the top one two three four I think this is like the parking lockout and that kind of stuff. Speedo drive is in, but I can't figure out why it won't tighten up. I'll have to go and read up about that in a minute. Um, first of all, really, we need to get that gear linkage done. Right, you probably can't see or make out very much of what's going on under here with these linkages. I'll be honest, it doesn't make a whole lot more sense when you're lying underneath the car looking at them in person either. So, um, what I've got to do is work out which one goes where and uh, take it from there. What I think I might do though is <laughs> just make sure nothing's gonna get broken and take it to a garage who know what they're doing because it needs setting up professionally anyway. Right, so I think this one here goes on that one there. Okay, yeah. I appear to be missing one of the connector rods because, let's move back a bit further. Here we are under the gear shifter. We've got one which is just a locator rod, just so 
you have like the position held in check and that little button up there which I can't quite reach from this angle is what does the selecting from the bottom of the gear shift lever so I need something with a little knuckle on it which should be able to uh, whoops, clonk onto that but I can't see anything under the car to do that, ah yeah and there if we look forward of the gear selector on the top of the gearbox that is what I need to be clipping to, I seem to be missing that rod that's very frustrating that's really annoying, so without that particular connector I can't go any further connecting the gearbox up damn what earth have I done with that? And with the gearbox lowered down at the back I've got access to reconnect these cooling pipes which go to the radiator at the front past all the engine gubbins um, because well I don't want them to get broken or lost and it'll, it'll stop dirt getting in the connections at the other end I did label them very carefully front and back so I knew which was which cunning huh I'll do them one at a time that'd be more sensible let's do the front one first well this is such a long weird tangly wire or cable pipe it's actually quite tricky to maneuver into place. I'm really glad I um, disconnected it before trying to drop the engine in because it's been mangled otherwise. Okay, that's one thing done at last. Hooray. While I'm down here, I'll do the starter motor wires as well. So this monster cable which comes out through the foot behind the brake pedal is alive. She comes direct from the battery, goes to the bulkhead, and straight to the starter motor. Well, this thing that was the engine dolly is proving incredibly handy for keeping the jacks out of the way. With the garage suddenly unexpectedly tidy, you now the engine's back in the car, I keep finding things to tidy. And uh, I keep walking past this jack handle and tripping over it, so I'm gonna hang this just here. I hung a broom up yesterday, which is a real novelty. Much better. Right, so I'm a little bit stuck as I can't find that control rod, but I think it's in the other garage, which next time I do my exercise run for the day, I will run past the garage with the keys and go and have a, a poke around there, see if I can find it. Um, other things I need to go and get hold of before I can get on with uh, installing this are a distributor cap, which will go just there, um, spark plugs, which will go in there, HT leads, which will link the two of them, um, this was a GEMS engine before, and that's a carburetor engine, and there's a sensor plate on the end of the belt housing cover, and I need to get a blanking plate for that. And that's not going to leak fuel, but we'll let dirt in when the car drives. This has now got an electric fuel pump rather than the mechanical fuel pump it came with, so I need to get a blanking plate for that before I even try turning it over, or the oil will fall out. Um, some nice new fixings, because I'm be missing quite a few. Um, and I need to just bolt everything back in. I've got some nice um, high-flow exhaust headers I traded someone for a couple of years ago, actually, when I first started this project. And I need to go and get the, the Y-pipe again from the other garage to see if they will actually fit or if I need to get a modification pipe made to adapt that together or not. So, again, a bit stuck on that. This whole being shut down and not being able to go places is putting a bit of a crimp on lots of things here. Um, meantime, I can really attach lots of stuff to the engine and the engine bay. Things like the accelerator linkage, I'm not gonna connect now because if the engine's gonna go up and down a few more times at the back to connect the gearbox, I will leave that alone rather than have that break. Um, but yeah, everything else I can just connect up in the meantime. Water pipes. I keep finding things to add to my shopping list. Because they're all quite old. Well, many are quite old. Some are quite new, but many are quite old. Um, water pipes times lots. Actually, what I will do right now, oh, apart from cleaning ash off this car, someone had a bonfire last night. My lovely, shiny, clean new engine is covered in bonfire ash now. It's horrible. Um, apart from cleaning that off, I will set TDC on piston number one, which is that one, so I can then put the distributor, which is on the floor, in there. And while I do that, and after I've done that, I will tell you the story of why I've got this car, because lots of people are new to this channel and won't necessarily know why I'm sticking this engine in this car and what the whole deal is. Right, so this is the old distributor, which I didn't mark on the uh, thing where number, oh, there, did I? Yeah, that looks like a mark for number one. 
excellent. Oh, something else I need. Haha, -ha, I need a new outer arm. That metal bit's dropped out there. That's interesting. Something which I will talk about later on is this has got electronic ignition added inside of it. So um, this is the replacing the points with this little electronic -y part. But with the engine set to TDC, this is set to. Where's that scratch mark I saw on the side of the thing? I've lost it now. Just there, that's number one. Just make sure this does actually fit and engage because I've been kind of nervous that this won't actually work with the new uh, drive gear, but I'm sure it's fine. Oops. Oops, let's move that round to where number one is. This is approximately TDC and, oh, it's moved. You have to remember to do that slightly round like that when you just twist it off a couple of degrees. I'm not gonna fit it now because obviously you have to prime the oil pump first. There we go. That slot in, yes it does. That's as engaged, so that is about uh, one, cylinder one on where the distributor gate will be. That's in TDC. That's all good. But I'll leave it in there for now because it won't get lost or broken when it's in there. Rotor arm to the shopping list, which grows by the moment. Oh, and also I just noticed that this warning light connector on the top of the brake fluid reservoir has actually broken. It's meant to be a double, but it's only a single now because it's snapped off. So brake reservoir fluid cap. Now the rest of what I'll be doing from here on in is pretty boring stuff. It's just reconnecting stuff like this. This is a facet electric fuel pump, which I just found the receipt for. 45 pounds in 1990, apparently it cost. Um, so interesting how long it's been on the car. So hopefully it still works when it goes back. And interesting how much they haven't really changed in price because the one I bought for the Mercedes recently was a very similar price, that was about 45 quid as well. And I think it's a far higher flowing pipe as well. Uh, this is where things get irritating, where stuff is tied to each other. That's the um, washer jets. Now where did this screw on? Oh, that's just there, isn't it? There we go. So much easier when there's no uh, external wing to get in the way. Done. Car's finished. Ah, the, the leaking fuel from earlier, I should address that because there will be comments. That was the reserve tap. When the engine went backwards at an extreme angle, it was putting a strange amount of pressure on it. And uh, when I moved the engine forward, suddenly the dripping stopped. So I think that's okay. Right, so let's have a little talk about this car and its history. I've not sat in this thing for absolutely ages. I mean, it's covered in dust. Oh, and I wondered where this was. This is about 130 quid's worth of power steering hose, which I bought some time ago off Mark Gray MGBD Rover Spares, and I've never got around to fitting because the engine was on the floor. And uh, I was, thought I'd lost it. That's quite lucky. Right, I'll get comfortable and I'll tell you a story. Oh, it's nice to be sat in this car again for the first, oh, blind me, this seat's not. Well, it's nice to be sat in this car again for the first time in quite a long time. Now, I've been looking through my big, big sheaf of documents that go with this car, and I've found all kinds of stuff that I've really forgotten. For example, I've owned this car since 2004. I've forgotten I had it for quite so long. It's basically 16 years. Well, I haven't actually been driving it for that much of that time, to be perfectly honest. Now, doing some interesting research, I went and found my British Motor Industry Heritage Trust certificate that goes with the car, which shows this car, chassis number, which is a British registered right-hand drive V8 automatic. Um, it was built by the Rover Company Limited in Solihull from parts manufactured in the UK in the year 1973, and it left the factory on the 27th of February, and it was dispatched to Henleys of London on the 28th of February. Now, this is where it gets interesting because I've also got the Passport to Service, which is the little book that comes with every Rover, or came with every Rover back way back when. In fact, I've still got the one for the White Rover as well. And it shows that this car wasn't registered until the 1st of April, 1973. April Fool's Day, and it's been making a fool of me ever since. But it wasn't registered by Henleys. It, must, it was registered by J.E. Bird Limited Automobiles, who are, or who were, I should say, in the Rover distributors, and dealer's um, fifth edition handbook. So either J.E. Bird were a subsidiary of Henley's or Henley's traded it to J.E. Bird in the couple of weeks between then and its first registration. And it was registered, as you can just about make out on here, 
the Columbia Ribbon and Carbon Manufacturing Company Limited. And their address is here in the front. They were in Kangley Bridge Road in Lower Sydenham, which is South London, kind of on the Kent border. Um, so it's not gone very far its entire life. And the Ribbon and Carbon Manufacturing Company, I did a bit of checking up on this, they used to make ribbons for typewriters and carbon paper for making duplicates of things before photocopiers were cheaply and freely available or you know domestic printers cost under 100 quid so i imagine they're not around anymore certainly they weren't when i looked for them a few years ago but it lived in and around sydenham and beckenham pretty much all its life with dealer stamps first of all at je birds and then moving on to days autos who are in beckenham which is also on the kent london border right up until the end of the 70s at which point the service history vanishes until some point, I think around the late 1980s, it was bought by a guy in Kent who I understand was in the police and may have been in the paras as well before that. And he was in quite a interesting kind of high level flying squaddy type job. And so the fact this was a Corsica blue car, which is the Met Police color, may have appealed to him, but he didn't use it for Met Police duties because he's got a tow bar on the back. He used it for towing caravans on holiday. And uh, this is the point, well, a few years on, when the car finally came to me. Because in 2004, his son wanted the garage back, where it had been sat since 1990. Um, his dad had fallen ill and very sadly passed away. And so, after a number of years, his son finally decided to get rid of the car. So he put a note on, this is pre-Facebook days, on the owner's forum. I saw it one day come up in what used to be the parts and cars for free section, because back in 2004, P6 values were still very much on the low side so you know giving away a v8 was not unheard of but it was only a couple of miles from home so naturally i dropped many miles i'd always wanted a v8 one i'd had my two liter one for over a decade at that point really wanted a v8 so i dropped him an email and the deal was he wanted someone who would take the car on it's his dad's car he was sentimentally attached but he didn't want to do the project himself he wanted someone who was going to restore it not bang erase it not strip it for parts back when these weren't worth a great deal of money and it had been stored in the garage for a well, about 15 years at that point. So I thought, well, how, how bad can it be? It was a running, driving, mot car when it was parked. I went and booked a recovery truck, met the guy at the appropriate time, put a rope on the back of the tow bar onto the recovery truck and pulled and pulled and pulled. And eventually, eventually the guy moved onto the big winch on the truck. And it was a bit like that scene from Jaws when the, the shark is pulling the boat backwards and the back of the boat is going underwater. This was the truck. It was on the verge of leaving two wheels off the ground because this car hadn't moved an inch. <laughs> so the recovery driver, fortunately, was well used to this kind of thing, was underneath it, whacking the brakes with a hammer until we've got it freed off. I towed it home, started working on it. it. Turned out, when I started investigating, the reason it had come off the road was because uh, the brake master cylinder had failed. And there was a repair kit in the glove box. Anyway, when I'd been along and checked the car, I knew where these things rotted because I've had one for so long and I knew the cars quite well. So I banged the sill where I was expecting to find rust and there was nothing. But when I got home and started probing it, where I banged in like one, two, three, four, the rust was in the half points. So in fact, it needed both of its sills repairing and it's in the wings at the front and the back. And it just needed everything basically. The entire car was really quite badly rotten. So before I could even drive it anywhere, I had to spend quite a lot of money having all the floor repaired. Uh, that was done by CCK Historic, who used to be called Classic Cars of Kent. And they're the people who did the deposts on my 2000 recently. And as I was using it, I, I noticed more things were not right with it. After I changed the brake master cylinder, that failed. And then the brake servo failed. And I got the last one in the UK because that, no one was making them at the time. I think now I'm making them again now, but at the time I was lucky to find one. Um, then I started sanding it to improve the paint because it, it looked nice in blue, but I've always wanted a black one. But as I started sanding the bubbles in every single panel, I realized every single panel was rotten. So I had to replace all eight panels around the car, all the doors and wings. Where I'd been sat in a garage for 15 years with one drip dripping on the bonnet all that time, it had rusted the aluminium. I've never seen aluminium corrode in that way before, but there was a hole in the aluminium bonnet. So I bought that, I rented a van, dropped off at the paint shop because at the time I was doing this, I was having one panel painted a month, sort of keep it in budget. So once a month I could take a panel around there because these panels will bolt off, get that one panel painted, bolt it onto the car as a nice new part. I bought the bonnet, it wasn't very expensive at the time because P6 bonnets weren't expensive back then. Rented a van, dropped off at the paint shop. He painted it, and but I thought, I don't want to rent another van and pay another 30 pounds to rent a van. I can be clever here. I can save some money. So knowing that the 
old aluminium bonnet with scrap. I bolted it onto the two litre car, drove it to the paint shop, put it in their metal bin when we got there so he could make a few pounds weighing it in, bolted the black bonnet onto the two litre car, which looked quite cool, like a rally car for that few moments, and drove off. Unfortunately, it turned out that the catch on the new black bonnet was defective. And as soon as I hit 30 miles an hour, it lifted up, bent the bonnet in half. So I had to go and buy another bonnet and rent another van twice. That was a bad day. Luckily the white car wasn't damaged in that experience, so it could have been a lot worse. Then I started driving it, but because it hadn't been driven for so long, it was massively unreliable. It broke down in all kinds of places. I drove it to work in London a few times and it broke down on the way to there. I thought it caught fire one day in a McDonald's car park. Smoke started coming out front of the dashboard, but it was just spider webs burning off as the uh, electricity started getting used. It uh, stranded me in Cambridge on the way to a, a rally in Lincolnshire. Um, so we had to spend a night in a motel on the A14. Um, it's trying to be in lots of places really. It got to the point where every time I turned the engine off, the timing would shift just a few degrees. So I'd have to jump out before I started the car next time with a 916 socket on an extender bar, loosen the distributor, move the distributor, then I could start the car again. This became boring, very boring. And so ultimately I decided I needed to take the engine out and change the timing gear. About 18 months ago, I pulled the engine out and then I started working on the engine and I thought this engine just feels grotty and tired. I wonder how much a slightly bigger capacity one would be. So I looked at 3.9s and they were going for quite good money. And then I noticed 4.6s were going for very little money indeed at all. And that was when we got onto this thing. And so for 300 pounds plus delivery or 350 all in, I bought a 4.6. And I thought I'd be changing that in a weekend until a bunch of studs broke. And then I wound up having to get a machine shop to come and take the studs out. And then once we was at the machine shop, then we did the crank, we did the heads, we you know, honed the bores, everything you need to do, because it looked like that 4.6 had been used in an off-roading kind of farm type P38. So make sure it was as good as possible. And here we are now. And that is the story of my car. But there we are. This is where we have reached in this story, this kind of 16 years of ownership um, in, in a very, very brief, brief potted history of this car. Part of the reason it got laid up for a while by me and not used very much apart from the unreliability was the fact it was a month too new. Back when the free tax for classic cars was a rolling 25 year thing. This was a month too new. So I'd get free tax on the White Rover, but then have to pay 200 and something pounds to tax this, which was really, really annoying because it was four weeks too new, which is just insane. So uh, yeah, until it became tax free, I kind of ignored it for a while. But there we are. Right, I'm gonna leave this for the time being. The next couple of videos probably won't be on this car because I'll very slowly in my own time button up all the loose wires, loose connections, brackets and things that need to be doing, which make a very boring video for you to watch. And I'll have to go and order the bits that are gradually collecting on that shopping list of cardboard. And uh, hopefully I'll go and find that connection rod in the other garage, along with, well, I hope the radiator is in there as well. I'm pretty sure I've seen the radiator in there. Um, it will need a bigger radiator and an oil cooler at some point as well, I have to add. But for the time being, just the old radiator will do just to get the engine started. Meantime, I'll do something on the Alpha and probably on the grey Mercedes and maybe the blue Mercedes and the Volvo if stuff turns up. But things are taking quite a long time to arrive, even on like Amazon Prime. So, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and I will see you again very soon.